I wanna be a producer with a hit show on Broadway. I wanna be a producer. Hello, Producers Perspective podcast listeners. Welcome back. Boy, I gotta tell you, when I started this thing, uh, I didn't realize I'd be as lucky as I have been sitting down with such incredible artists. And today is another one of those days. Uh, I'm not going to complain about it, though. Uh, today, my guest is none other than the Tony Award-winning playwright, David Henry Huang. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thanks for having me on your podcast. So David burst onto the playwriting scene in the late 80s with his Tony Award and Drama Desk Award-winning play, M. Butterfly, which was also a Pulitzer contender. Since then, gone on to write many more plays, including Golden Child, Chinglish, which I was a producer on. Thank you. Uh, one of the funniest things I've seen in the last decade or so. And a bunch of other books for musicals, including a couple of shows uh, for Disney, uh, Aida and Tarzan, uh, and as well as the reworked R&H classic Flower Drum Song. Uh, written for Hollywood, for opera. We were just talking about television, which we'll get into in a few minutes. But let's um, let's go back to the beginning, David. How how did you get started as a writer? Where did the inspiration come? From? Um, so I don't actually come from a theatrical family. I'm not one of these people who grew up, you know, going to theater. Um, if anything, I came from a musical family because my mother was a pianist. Uh, but my father and my father and mother were both um, Chinese immigrants, and my father ended up being a banker. So. When I got to college, I saw some plays my freshman year. Um, I went to Stanford, and we um, got bussed up to see shows at American Conservatory Theater. Um, and I saw the uh, Bill Ball production of The Winter's Tale, as well as um, a production of Thornton Wilder's The Matchmaker. And I began to think, hmm, maybe I can do this. Um, so I started writing plays in my spare time, and I found a professor who was willing to uh, take a look at them. He told me they were really bad, which they were, uh, because I wanted to write theater, but I didn't actually know anything about the stage. Uh, but the same professor was a good guy, and we kind of designed a playwriting major at a school that still doesn't have one today. And I saw as many plays and read as many plays as I could. Um, and my senior year, I wrote a play to be done in my dorm, which through a variety of fortuitous circumstances got produced by Joe Papp at the Public Theater uh, about 14 months later, and then I started to have a career. So this was at Stanford, yeah. where you designed your own major, pretty yes. much. I have to, you probably haven't heard of these, but both Teresa Rebeck and John Rando, who've done podcasts for me, have said the exact same thing in college. They had to design their own major in order to do what they wanted to do. So that first play you wrote, what was it? Um, it was called FOB, uh, for Fresh Off the Boat. And it was about the conflict between fresh off the boat immigrants and ABCs, or American born Chinese. And I started writing it, I was fortunate uh, between my junior and senior year in college to, I was home in LA and I saw an ad in the LA Times calendar that said, study playwriting with Sam Shepard. So I clipped this thing and I sent it in. And it was the first year of what was subsequently a pretty significant event in Southern California theater uh, called the Padua Hills Playwrights Festival. But this was only the first year that they ever tried to do this. So there were only two of us that applied to be students. We both got in. And at Padua, um, I got to study with Sam and Maria Irene Fornes, uh, Walter Hadler, Murray Mendick, a lot of great writers um, who taught us to write more from our subconscious. And when I started doing that, I didn't know I was going to end up writing about a lot of the subjects that I've ended up you know, writing about uh, East-West issues and immigration and assimilation, but these issues started appearing on the page. So clearly, some part of me was incredibly interested in this, but my conscious mind hadn't figured that out yet. And that led to this first play, FOB. And that was the play that went to the public? Yes. So talk to me about that. You get the call, oh, your show is going to go to the public. I mean, what was that... <laughs> Well, I mean, first it got accepted. I sent it to the National Playwrights Conference, the Eugene O'Neill Conference, which happens every year in Waterford, Connecticut. And so my first big break was that um, it got chosen to be part of the conference. And I think they got had 1,300 submissions that year, and they, they chose a dozen plays. So that uh, got me some attention. And then the public had done a play, about the time I was writing FOB, the public had done a play by Len Jenkins called New Jerusalem, in which a Caucasian actor was cast in an Asian role. And this led to yellow-faced protests from the actors of that day, uh, 10 years before the whole Miss Saigon controversy. 
um, and Joe Papp, who the founder and, and uh, producer at the public, uh, Joe being who he was, he invited the protesters into his office and ended up hiring one of them onto his staff with the brief to find plays for Asian actors. And it was just about that time that FOB came across his desk. So I've always considered myself the beneficiary of affirmative action because that's really what affirmative action is. It's like someone sees a need and creates a program to try to address it. And I was the guy who was lucky enough to get to walk through that door and take advantage of that opportunity. And how was the play received? It's actually received really well. Um, it, I won an Obie for uh, Best uh, American Play that year. And it was one of Frank Rich's earliest reviews for the New York Times. Um, and he, he uh, reviewed it very, very well. Well, well that's, <laughs> that's something to say, knowing his track record. So you submit this play. It gets up. You get a good review from the New York Times. What's the trajectory next? Did everyone just hound you? Look, the, the, the second coming is here. Well, no. Then I went to, then I went to drama school. Because I, you know, it, everything had happened so quickly, and I hadn't actually, I didn't feel like I had enough background in theater history. Um, I really wanted to read more and know more about what had come before. So I went to Yale, and during my first year at Yale, it's a three-year program, you get all your academics out of the way. So I got my theater history, but I wasn't there very much because um, I had a second play that ended up being that I wrote, which was not the new Federal Theater, which also got a good review in the New York Times, and so then Joe was going to move that to the public. I had a third play that Joe was going to produce, so I just was never in New Haven, so I dropped out. So how soon after did M. Butterfly happen? So um, FOB was produced in 1980, and um, M. Butterfly was in 88. So I did four plays at the public and one play at second stage. Uh, in the interim before having my first Broadway play, M. Butterfly. And talk to me about where the inspiration for M. Butterfly came from. I was at a, a cocktail party, and it's the sort of story one would hear at a cocktail party, and somebody said, you know, have you heard about the French diplomat who had a 20-year affair with a Chinese actress who turned out to be, you know, A, a spy, and B, a man in drag, or a transgender woman, as we would say nowadays. And the diplomat claimed that he never knew the true gender of his lover. And obviously I thought, well, that's really interesting. And I began thinking, uh, I, I wanted to write something about it, but I originally thought of it as a musical. Um, at the time, I was working with the producer Stuart Ostro, who is probably best known for having produced 1776 and Pippin in its original productions. And Stuart and I were working on a musical which never actually happened. But I thought about doing M. Butterfly as a musical, and I wrote him a proposal. And I thought you know, what did this diplomat think that he'd found? And the answer came to me, oh, he probably thought he'd found his version of Madame Butterfly. And at that point, the idea of dovetailing the events of the spy story and the plot of Madame Butterfly seemed like an interesting way to, to get at the material. So I wrote Stuart this proposal, and he um, supplied some early funding to help me do research because this was, you know, obviously pre-internet, and uh, most of the information was in France. And... Then I didn't actually, I'd never written a musical. I didn't know any composers. I didn't know, and I thought, you know, I'm just going to write as a play. So I wrote it as a play and sent it to Stuart, sort of as a courtesy, not because he'd only done musicals up to that point. And Stuart decided he was going to produce the play on Broadway, and that's how, that's how we, we got started. So it goes on and is a big hit. And then we'll flash forward a little bit since we're on the musical subject. Mm -hmm. You start, you write musicals later on in your career. So how did that, come about? Were you, were you always interested in that form? You know, I, I've always been interested in putting music into plays. So I think going back to my earliest plays, even, you know, FOB and Dance in the Railroad, they had, uh, they had dance, they had Chinese opera movement, they had uh, music to accompany that. But I'd never written a musical proper. Um, after I'm Butterfly, I started getting offers to write opera libretti. I mean, Philip Glass asked me first, and we did two together. And then I was one of the few people, you know, living people who'd written on opera libretti. So I started getting offers for other libretti. But I didn't really think of working on a musical proper until the late 90s. And it wasn't to write a musical. It was to revise Flower Drum Song. I really wanted to, that was my goal. And Flower Drum Song, was, you know, is a Rodgers and Hammerstein musical uh, the only musical that's ever been uh, written in Broadway history up until the current season and Allegiance uh, prior to that. 
Flower Drum Song was the only musical about Asian Americans, as opposed to Asians in Asia, which had ever uh, been on Broadway. And it's sort of fallen into, you know, off the face of the earth by the time you get to the late 90s. Um, some people felt it was stereotypical. Some people just felt it wasn't the best Hammerstein book, the book by Hammerstein and Fields. Um, and Hammerstein was, you know, st had been diagnosed with uh, the cancer that would eventually kill him during that period, so he wasn't around much. And a, a lot of people just was, you know, felt it wasn't their best book. So, you know, we had entered the era of revisicals by the time you get to the n late 90s. So I asked the Rogers and Hammerstein estate for permission to do a revisical. And, uh, and they were incredibly gracious and supportive. And then I started working on that. And that took a long time because I thought that, oh, well, this will, this will be pretty easy because the, you know, my collaborators are no longer around. Rogers and Hammerstein are no longer around. So I can just do what I want. And what I learned was that it's actually quite the opposite, that because my creators were not around, they couldn't actually change anything. And then, you know, uh, the musical director, David Chase, talked about the DNA of songs. So the songs are created to do something. And when you have geniuses like r &H, they're created very well to do that thing. And you try to make the song do something it's not, it wasn't created to do. And it's, you know, very difficult. The song will rebel against that. So it took me a long time, and I worked with uh, Bobby Longbottom, who directed and choreographed the, the, the production, to learn about musical theater. And before that could get up, I got approached by Disney to, um, to come on as part of the rewriting team for um, Aida. So talk to me a little bit about the difference between writing a play and a musical. So now Aida, you are, of course, there's some source material mm -hmm. there that you can base it on, but is there a different approach for you for a play versus a musical? You know, I think that writing a book for a musical is is actually quite humbling in the sense that when you write a play, you you know, you you build a scaffolding uh, dramatically and you're building to the big monologue or you're building to the big conflict and then you get to write that big when you're writing a musical you build the scaffolding, but then you don't get to, you know, you don't get to have the orgasm, really. You, you hand the orgasm over to the uh, lyricist and the, um, and the composer. So I think, you know, it's, it's much more structural. It's much more about craft. And, and I think it's also tricky because, you know, now that I've worked in a number of different forms, I feel like every form, there's somebody who's the primary creative artist and every, and the others people support that. So if it's a play, it's a play, right? If it's a movie, it's usually the director. Uh, in an opera, it's the composer. But in a musical, you kind of need to do a mind meld between, uh, you know, the book writer, the lyricist, the composer, uh, the producer, the director. I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of people who are really responsible for, for, ha for having the vision for the piece. And as a result, uh, I, I mean, I think that's why so many musicals, for instance, are based on other source material. Because it at least gives you something concrete for four or five artists to say together, okay, this is what we want to do. We want to adapt Gypsy Rose Lee's memoirs. And, you know, as opposed to, you know, we want to do a musical about, um, you know, some, some sort of some reincarnation or something. Um, and, and it's not to say that there aren't. Certainly, there, certainly there are successful musicals that are original, but I think it's a lot harder. Do you, we were just talking before about uh, writing for the television show you're working on right now, and I was going to ask you a question that we got cut off, and now I'll ask it here. Uh, do you find that you write more for the for an actor in television or in film versus the stage? Do you find getting more feedback or, you, or voicing a specific actor? I mean, I, I haven't done... I've just finished my first season working on uh, on an episodic television show. I've I've um, been a writer producer for season two of The Affair on Showtime, and so I'm still learning a lot about that form. But it is certainly true that, I mean, when you get a TV show, and particularly when the sh show is fortunate to run for a few seasons, um, you know, you go into the process, you, you go into season two with the actors in place. But the story is not necessarily in place. And the characters, you have a set of characters that have been developed already. You might add new characters. Those, those characters obviously need to continue changing. But I think the actor ends up having a great deal more influence and input simply by virtue of the fact that they continue from season to season. And 
when you begin a new season, there are no scripts yet. So you, how long did it take you, for example, to write a first draft of M. Butterfly? Are you a fast writer? Or are you? I'm a relatively fast writer. I think I've gotten a little slower as I've gotten older. But I mean, the first draft of M. Butterfly probably took between six to eight weeks. I thought about it a long time before I started writing. And like any script, it got rewritten a fair amount. Uh, but the first draft, yeah. So talk to me about your rewriting process. So, for example, six to eight weeks, you get M. Butterfly. Mm -hmm. What percentage of it do you think changed from the end of the first draft to opening night on Broadway? Um, there are, you know, different plays require different amounts of rewriting. So I feel like I sometimes say, you know, you're like you're trying to bake a cake, and sometimes they come out of the oven pretty much like a cake, and sometimes they don't. M. Butterfly would have to say I didn't rewrite that much. Um, I would say maybe 15% of it got rewritten. And it was also in an era before the amount of play development that we tend to do nowadays. So, uh, for instance, I never even heard the play read out loud until the first day of rehearsals for the Broadway production. And it was just a different way of doing things. I mean, fortunately, that particular play uh, ended up being pretty close to, the, you know, how it where it needed to be. But, you know, and that, it was also working with John Dexter, who directed M. Butterfly, who also had directed Equus and been a resident director at the Metropolitan Opera and was, you know, helped one of the founders of the National Theater. John also came from an older school of British playwriting and, and, and directing where the director was not... The directors were not necessarily expected to have opinions about the script. So, um, you know, John liked the script enough, and I think I think liked it very much, and that's why he took on the project. But, you know, when we were, we did our out-of-town trout in Washington, D.C. at the National, and, um, you know, when I, and I did end up rewriting a fair amount when we were in D.C., uh, you know, and John was not unhappy when I would bring in rewrites, but I, I think he felt like, oh, this is something else he has to stage. So I wish we had video for this podcast because everyone would have seen the shocked look on my face when David just said that the first time he heard it out loud was at the first rehearsal because that is just the exact opposite. No one would ever consider doing that now. Yeah. Do you think we're overdeveloping shows now? I think we can overdevelop shows. Like I said, I feel like every show is its own kind of beast and different shows need different things and I think when we get into a sort of one size fit all, fits all development model then that's a problem because some shows you know are a cake when they come out and, and others do need as much development as we have now I think there are probably examples in the old days where shows didn't get enough development but I think the point is to try to be very sensitive to what each particular project needs yeah we've seen some great successes of that I'm thinking of well, to talk about musicals, Book of Mormon, everyone was so shocked when it didn't do its out of town or in town and it just mm -hmm. came straight in. And of course, that cake seemed to be ready. Yeah. So it is worth looking at that not one size fits all. I love that. Uh, do you read reviews? Um, I, I like to have reviews summarized to me because I like to know how the show's going to do. But I tend not to read them. Because I don't really want to know that much. I just want to know the basic tenor of the review. Do you listen? How, when you're, a show is in previews, how do you get feedback? Do you ask, is it director? Do you, are you listening to the audience or are you just going on your own gut and knowing I mean, what I'm, you I'm certainly listening to the audience as an organic entity. I feel like the audience is never wrong, basically, in the sense that. Uh, you know, if the, you think something's funny and they're not laughing, it's not the audience's fault. It's, uh, you know, it could be the actors, it could be the production. Could, but so I learn a lot from the audience. I think one of the most harrowing, you know, parts of the process, really, but, and also uh, by the same token, one of the most important and revelatory is that first preview. You learn so much by listening to the audience. And, you know, it, it, it's usually about stuff that isn't working and you have to fix. That's why it's scary. Is there an, ever an example of your work where you were totally shocked that the audience response was the opposite, good or bad? You know, I have to work? say that um, Chinglish was a show that I did not realize was as much of a comedy as it ended up being. You know, I thought it was sort of, and it's for those of the, the, your, the listeners who don't know it, it's, it's about an American businessman who goes to China to try to make a deal, and the play's about a third in Mandarin, and we used 
we projected supertitles to translate the Mandarin into English. So, you know, I thought it was pretty amusing that there were a lot of uh, mistranslations in the show, but I didn't actually realize until I heard it, probably at the first reading, that um, that it was it, that it was a farce in the sense that you know classical farce is the audience knows more than the characters on stage. So the audience knows that the mistress is hiding in the closet, but the characters don't know, and so the audience is is omniscient and gets to watch the 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 the, the characters scramble. And Chinglish ended up working that way too because the audience knew everything that everybody was saying, but not everybody on stage, and all the characters did not necessarily know what each other was saying, and it ended up being a farcical structure, which was a surprise to me, pleasantly so. And me as well. Do uh, you think it's easier for a playwright to get started today than it was when you got started, or harder? I think it's harder. Um, I feel like the, the main advantage of coming up when I did was that the field was still growing, particularly when you talk about not-for-profit theater. Uh, so not-for-profit theater was growing in that, you know, for all intents and purposes, it didn't come into existence. Uh, and there's, I mean, there's some in the 50s, but really they, it all started um, after the creation of the National Endowment of the Arts. Um, and so starting from the late 60s, you, you have not-for-profit theaters being founded all around the country. So it was a field that was still growing until about the mid-90s. And um, similarly, the Broadway, and this is, I think, pretty well uh, documented in Michael Riedel's new book, you know, Broadway was in big trouble in the 70s. And, uh, you know, Broadway started to grow a in the 80s. And so if you were coming up during that period, you were dealing with a, a field that was growing where there were more opportunities. And now I think it's hard because there are a lot of people who want to do it, and, and Broadway certainly, and musicals in particular, are, are really hot and probably closer to the heart of uh, American popular culture than they've been at any time since the 1950s. So that's all great, but a lot of people want to do it, and they're not, the number of opportunities are not necessarily getting larger, and then you still have kind of baby boomer playwrights like myself, like, you know, stick, sticking around and like taking up slots. So I think it's hard for a young playwright. Any advice for those out there looking to get started? Um, you know, I've come to feel that you never know what is going to be commercial. And maybe producers do, but I don't. And I don't think artists necessarily have to know or really should know. If you look at M. Butterfly, nobody thought that was going to be a hit. And in fact, uh, one of the co-producers tried to shut it down after the... Uh, after we got bad reviews in Washington, D.C., and Stuart Ostro, the producer, had to mortgage his house to get us to New York, and we went into the Eugene O'Neill, and we had a tiny, you know, I don't know, we had you know, a few thousand dollars of advance, and no money to even have an opening night party. Um, and I think the cast, there's like a betting pool about when the show is going to close. So no one expected that show to be a hit. In a way, that's a good thing, because it, I think it forces young writers, and writers of all ages, really, to fall back on writing what you really believe. Um, and that's what's going to, that is just as likely to be successful as something that you calculate for commercial gain. But if you write something that explores what you need to, what, the questions you need to ask yourself as an artist, and you make the discoveries that you need to, to make as an artist, then you've already won, no matter what happens to the play. And then success is the icing on the cake. But it, success shouldn't be the cake. Success has to be the icing. My uh, shock face number two for me when I hear there was no opening night party for M. Butterfly on Broadway. No. Uh, There's no money. I mean, you've had many parties on M. Butterfly since then, I, yes. I would hope. It, fortunately, that's one of those Broadway stories that all worked out. And maybe coming back? We hear uh, we are, we are, yeah, we are sort of in discussions. It, it's about, you know, that period of time. It's, it was originally done in 88, and um, so I, I think it's, it's due for a revival. So you were born here, even though your parents were, were yes. Chinese immigrants. Uh, obviously, that's had a big influence on your work subconsciously, mm -hmm. I guess, to well, start. Now, consciously, as soon as I started writing one. Uh, how do you think we're doing with diversity uh, on Broadway and in theater in general in this country? Um, well, you know, there's People talk about, for instance, the fact that last season was one of the least diverse uh, in recent years, and the current season is one of the most diverse in recent years. So it's difficult to say whether there are patterns that are happening or not. 
I feel that Broadway, at least at this point, and theater in general, at least has the desire to become more diverse. And if not, it's not even really a social justice issue. It's a question at this point of changing demographics and markets. And everybody knows that by 2040, people of color are going to be majority in this country. And every industry in America is trying to prepare for that and reach out to, uh, to all this new purchasing power. I think Broadway also wants to do that. I don't feel that we've quite figured out how to do it yet. Um, you know, Hamilton is a, a step in, in certainly in, in a, a great direction. Um, and I love that show. But in general, I, I don't know that we have figured out how to make diverse audiences feel welcome in the theater. You know, sometimes people talk about ticket price, and I think ticket price is certainly a huge issue in the theater in general. But it's it overlaps, but it's not the same as the diversity issue because, you know, our tickets are no more expensive than tickets to see, what, Beyonce and Jay-Z, but their audiences look much more like America than ours. So uh, I believe that when audiences feel welcome, they will they will buy tickets. And, you know, as an Asian American, Asians certainly have in general, a fair amount of purchasing power, um, and yet are not particularly, you know, well represented in Broadway audiences. So I still think we have a lot of work to do. And it, to me, relates to diversifying content and diversifying uh, who we cast, because everybody wants to see themselves on stage. Right. That's, you make an excellent point there that I've talked about a bunch, which is diversifying of the content. And you're a perfect example of this. You are an Asian American and you write a number of plays dealing with those issues and therefore need actors that are Asian or Asian American. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that the way to get more diversity on the stages is to get more diverse playwrights and more content creators. I world. think so. And, you know, and also to cast, uh, cast things, uh, with a wide range of actors that, that you don't have to assume that a character whose race isn't specified needs to be cast with a Caucasian actor. Okay, so my last question, which uh, we call my genie question, inspired by the genie from Aladdin, I want you to imagine for a moment that the genie comes to you and says, David, you've done such a wonderful job uh, since you started writing plays and creating that major at Stanford uh, to today, and I want to thank you for that by granting you one wish. What's the one thing that drives you so crazy about Broadway? that makes you angry, you're a very even-tempered, nice guy. What makes you mad, keeps you up at night, that you would want this genie to change with a snap of his fingers or a wave of his wand? Um, I think it is this issue of diversity. That has been something that has motivated me since I was a kid, in the sense that I remember, you know, when I was, whatever, 12 or 13, I if I knew that there was going to be an Asian character in a in a, a movie or a TV show, I would go out of my way not to watch it because given the way that Asians were portrayed in those days, I knew, you know, just sort of intuitively sensed that it would make me feel bad. And, and so therefore it's somewhat not surprising that I've ended up consciously or unconsciously uh, writing about some of the things that I have. And I think diversity on Broadway is a huge issue for the future of Broadway and for the future of the theater. We need to be able to reach out to varied audiences, and that includes economic diversity. How do we create a situation where the ticket prices are, are not uh, beyond the reach of uh, middle class people, uh, tourists, um, New Yorkers? Um, so that's what I would ask the genie to fix. If there was one thing, you specific thing you think we could do, Broadway, to make this better, more welcoming to the audience. You, you mentioned earlier that ticket prices, sure, every ticket price could be cheaper for everyone. Yeah. So putting ticket prices aside, what's the one thing we could do on Broadway to make it more welcoming for a more diverse audience? Um, I think if whether through the choice of material or through casting, um, the the diversity of actors on stage represented the diversity of America. I think that would be a huge step in the right direction. 
Terrific answer. Thank you so much for spending your, I know your very busy schedule carving a little time out for us. We got to get you back to that TV show. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you all of you for listening. And next week, get this. You talked about Rogers and Hammerstein. Next week, Ted Chapin, the president of Rogers and Hammerstein. Ted's great. He's so smart and was so helpful with my projects. So. Yes. And I'm going to ask him all about Flower Drum Song. Uh, so make sure you tune in for that. Thanks so much. We'll see you then. Bye-bye.